My goodness. So many people here. Thank you so much for having me. Um, this is entirely new for me. I've never been an author before, and I've certainly never been a speaker before, much less an international one. So um, here we go. <laughs> Let's do our best. Um, I'm going to start with a terrible joke. You've probably heard it before, but I'm very Novi happy to be here in Novi sad. <laughs> no. Terrible, terrible, terrible. Um, who here has read or listened to the book, The Myth of Normal, that I wrote with my father, Gabor Mate? The front row. The front row gets extra credit. <laughs> Teacher's pets. All right. So, good. So, then that means that this topic will be um, uh, more new and novel for the rest of you. Great. So, I'm, it's a big book. Uh, it's about a 500-page book. I'm not possibly going to be able to sum it up, but I'm going to focus on a couple of aspects of it that, from what I understand about your culture and where you guys are at, that I hope will be uh, especially useful to you. And I guess you can let me know afterwards uh, by your applause or your total blank silence whether or not I succeeded. Um, the book is called The Myth of Normal. Well, maybe I should say a little something about myself. I'm 47 years old. I'm from Canada originally. I live in New York City in Brooklyn. And up until recently, I thought of myself mainly as a musical theater writer. So I write musicals. So, you know, Hamilton, Wicked, The Little Mermaid. I write those things. Uh, not those ones, but that type of thing. Um, and then my father asked me to write, to co-write, his next book with him, his fifth book. And he's written four books in the past, and they've all been very successful, especially in Canada, but increasingly internationally, and it's been translated into Serbian, just like this new one will be next year. But he needed help with this one because it was the biggest project he had ever taken on. This book is about more than one type of health issue, one condition, one topic. It's about the whole world, really. It's about the world we're living in and the health of people in the world we're living in and trying to connect the dots between a lot of seemingly mysterious things like why is it that in the richest countries in the world chronic health issues are going up, chronic diseases are going up, mental health diagnoses are going up, addiction rates are going up, suicidality is going up, Self-cutting, self-harm is going way up among populations that we've never seen it before. How could this possibly be? And the title of the book gives a clue to how we see that. The myth of normal, trauma, illness, and healing in a toxic culture. That's a, that's a nice light title, right? Uh, so what does that mean? Well, the myth of normal. When we say normal, and I'm not a doctor, I'm not a psychologist. I'll tell you a little bit maybe at the end about my mental chiropractic practice, but I'm not trained in that. I made that up completely myself. Um, but in the medical profession, when we use the word, when they use the word normal, it has a legitimate meaning, which is to say there are normal ranges of various kinds of functioning within which the human body can survive and thrive. So if our, if our temperature is normal, we're comfortable. If it rises too high, we call that a fever. That's not normal. And if it rises way too high, well then, there's no more fever anymore because we're dead, right? If it rises too low, if, 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 it, if it gets too low, we call that hypothermia. And again, below a certain range, life isn't possible. Same thing with pH levels, um, oxygen levels, blood pressure, any, any range of, of ways you can measure health. And also, when we say normal, you know, a doctor might say to a woman who comes in, you know, she's pregnant, she's having some kind of complication or symptom, and she says, I'm really worried. He says, he or she says, don't worry, that's normal, which means statistically it happens, and it's not anything to worry about. Those are helpful and useful uses of the word normal, and they're also pretty limited. 
the way that we mean normal in the title, the myth of normal, well, the trouble with normal is that it's hard to see. Right? If something is normal, if it's truly normal, you're not going to notice it. Like, for instance, I'm breathing right now, right? Which means that this room is filled with a certain amount of oxygen, enough for all of us, several hundred of us, to breathe in, breathe out comfortably, and walk out of here alive. Well, that's normal. I don't walk into the room and go, wow, feel that oxygen. Or it's a really good thing I can breathe. No, I take it for granted. And that should be normal. It's a good thing I get used to that, because that would be really distracting if I was... Same thing with gravity. I'm not floating up towards the ceiling right now, which would be interesting, but it would mean I was also in the musical Wicked, which is not what this is, right? Maybe you haven't seen Wicked, but there's a fly... The, the witch flies. Um, and the song is actually called Defying Gravity, which means, right, that gravity is the norm and that if we can defy it, that's a special exception. But what, so those things are, those normal are healthy for us. But what if normal, what if what we've gotten used to in society or in our lives isn't healthy? And we tell a story, uh, or an example of a story that David Foster Wallace, who was a brilliant American writer, also a very tortured genius who ended up killing himself after writing many, many wonderful books. He told a story once during a commencement speech to a university about two young fish who were swimming along one day, and they happened to pass by an older fish. And the older fish says to the two younger fish, morning boys, how's the water? And then the two fish just swim on by. And a few minutes later, they turn to, one turns to the other and says, what the hell is water? Why did you see that? Because water is normal to them. They don't notice it. So what if we human beings have gotten used to some things that we don't even see anymore, that we think are normal, that we don't question, but that are actually harming our health? And when you think about it, Human beings, we are the most adaptable species on the planet, maybe except for the cockroach or the bac certain bacteria. But certainly of all the mammals, we have the ability to live in the, in the greatest variety of environments, right? There are people who have cultures who have lived near the North Pole. There's people who have lived in the middle of the blazing desert. We can live during wartime. We can live during peacetime. I don't think I need to tell you guys that, right? <laughs> we can live uh, as farmers, we can live as hunters, we can live alone, we can live, we can live in, in, in small towns, small villages, we can live in huge cities. We're very adaptable. And again, there's a lot of advantages to that. But here's one of the disadvantages. We are very capable of getting used to things that are har harmful to us that are normal, but they're not natural, and they're not normal from the perspective of our human evolution. So now, if, my, if I was my father, whom I'm not, in case you didn't know, he would probably take the conversation in one direction. I'm going to take it in a slightly different one, although how do I know? He's not here. I'm going to take it in the direction I'm going to take it in. One of the things that we've gotten used to in this culture is what we call trauma. Now, uh, from what I'm told, and this is just what my hosts have told me, uh, and some of the podcasters, the wonderful podcasters, Dolores, Galeb, um, Vesna, Andre, um, the past few days, is that there's something in Serbian or maybe Balkan culture that says, don't complain. Suck it up. You're, you're wounded, you're hurt, so what? Other people have it worse. Get over it, get on with your life. Does that sound familiar? Is that sort of the norm here? So that's normal. So maybe if I hadn't pointed it out, you would have been like, yeah, obviously, but I'm a foreigner, so I'm gonna notice it. Uh, in, in North American parlance, why does my screen always freeze? Uh, we might call that a do-it-yourself do attitude, or as you might say, Uradisam, <laughs> right? All right, good. Um, 
Well, if that's the attitude, then it's going to be difficult to talk about trauma. Now, it's because of how we're defining, how we're defining trauma. Now, I assume that people who have lived through war and genocide can recognize that that can be traumatic, right? That's not controversial. You've seen people with PTSD. Maybe some of your parents bore the psychological and possibly even physical scars of war, or growing up in families where someone had been killed or maimed. And in way too many places in the world today and in the past few generations for really centuries, that is a feature of life. For instance, my father barely survived the Holocaust growing up in Budapest along with my grandparents, and their entire family was killed. So that's a, that's a big trauma, what we call a capital T trauma. And other capital T traumas would include um, child abuse, whether it's sexual or physical or emotional in many cases, like real harm being done, um, starvation, uh, uh, famine, natural disasters, uh, a rancorous, uh, like a, a sort of hostile divorce in childhood can be traumatic to, to witness that level of conflict. Addiction in the family, uh, mental health issues in the family can be traumatic or traumatizing, let's say. And it's understandable that if a people like the people in this part of the world have been through a collective trauma, they might say, well, that's over. So now you young people, you have no idea what we went through. That's a familiar sentence? Yeah. yeah? Don't complain to me about being scared. Don't complain to me about being depressed. I'll show you depressed. Um, and sometimes that can translate into a kind of self-reliance where things like therapy or anything else where you're admitting that you're vulnerable becomes sort of taboo. And I've been told that the idea that, you know, just ordinary people can benefit from doing some therapy is sort of a new idea here in Serbia. And again, these podcasters I've been speaking to, people who are really innovating here, given that innovation is the theme of this, one of the themes of this um, conference, uh, are innovating a new normal in your culture where it's possible to say, you know what, I'm carrying some emotional wounds. I could use some help. Um, but still, I assume that most people think, I assume that most people assume that trauma is about bad events. Well, that is one kind of trauma. Like I said, we might call that a capital T, a big T trauma. There's also a little t trauma. And that's the kind that is more invisible, more normal, because you don't have to be Serbian to go through that kind of trauma. You don't have to be Jewish or Hungarian or grow up in a difficult, you know, you can grow up in the lap of luxury in, on the Upper West Side in Manhattan or in Vancouver where I grew up or somewhere that seems very peaceful and still be wounded because the word trauma is just a, a Greek word. It's from the Greek word for wound. So trauma is just a wound. And there's more than one kind of thing that can wound us because human beings have certain needs. We're born with certain needs. We, were, we evolved over tens of thousands of years, maybe more, to have certain needs upon birth. And if those needs are not met, that can leave a wound because the needs are correlated with our development. So a tree has certain needs. You can have a perfectly healthy seed, right? But if I gave that to you and you planted it in a sandbox, what would happen to that seed? Nothing is the answer, or very little, because that environment is not appropriate for that organism. The organism needs a certain kind of soil with a certain level of moisture and irrigation, certain level of sunlight, spaciousness, distance from other plants in order to become itself. There was nothing wrong with the seed. Now, maybe there's something in between. You could plant that seed in ground that has some nutrients but not enough. It gets not enough sunlight. It's crowded. Well, then that it's, you could imagine that seed growing into some kind of plant, but the tree would not reach its full height. It might be stunted or twisted. It would have to 
adapt to its environment. So its needs for maximum thriving and growth are a certain kind of environment, and if it gets a compromised version of that environment, then it'll become a compromised version of itself. Now, our needs in childhood include, and this is just the way it is, and there's no blame in any of this. See, when I give you this definition of trauma, you're going to realize there's no, there can't be any blame because no one escapes it. If our parents traumatized us, well, they were traumatized before we were. You know, It's a chain. It's intergenerational. Our needs include being loved unconditionally. And I don't mean the feeling of love. I don't mean parents, oh, I love you so much, little baby, because almost every parent in the world has felt that. And at their best, hopefully in the moment of birth, it's one of the most joyful moments, although even that can be traumatic depending on the context. And there are plenty of moments throughout childhood where that love is there. But for many of us, our parents are not able to fully embrace and accept all of who we are. They prefer this part of me to that part of me. They would rather I be like this than like that. Why? Because they're afraid of that part of themselves or they didn't get it as children or they're too stressed by their job or by their own trauma. There are a million reasons why a parent's ability to provide that need would be compromised and they have nothing to do with the parent being an evil person. Parents really do their best. It's just that they have to do their best under stressful circumstances, both external stresses and internal stresses. We need, our, we need our caregivers to be as unstressed as possible because when a parent is unstressed, it means that they can pay attention to the infant, look into its eyes, give it all their attention, respond to it in an active, what we call an attuned way. If you think of attunement has the word tuning in it, like a tuning fork, is what's used in music to tune a guitar, for instance, right? So it's tuning up, getting in sync, in frequency with the child. Again, the way we used to live in small hunter-gatherer groups or big tribes or villages, that was a lot easier because it wasn't just the parents. You had a whole village so the parents could take a break, you know, go for a walk, take a swim, go on a date, I don't know. I don't know what parents used to do back in the day. But in this society, with families that are so atomized and made nuclear, meaning that they're just a self-contained nucleus, parents don't have that support, and we're living in a society that imposes a lot of stress on people. And so th those, those are just two basic needs that I've told you. There are others. But already you can see what's the likelihood that a child growing up in this culture, whether it's your culture or my culture, anywhere in the world right now, anywhere in the Western world, and many parts of the Eastern world too, what are the odds that a child is going to receive that unconditional love, the right to express all of their emotions? Like how many children get told, stop crying? Parents get told, don't pick up your baby if they're crying. It'll spoil them. Well, actually, what's going to spoil them in the sense of wound them and leave them with a mark for the rest of their lives is if you don't pick them up, because, and again, if any parents have been told, you know, are, I'm, I'm not accusing anybody here, it's not morally right or wrong, I'm just telling you that when a child is left alone to cry, I mean that, again, in indigenous cultures, tribal cultures, that never happened. Parents didn't put their kids down for the first three years of life. They held them close. Because the child needs that security before they feel safe enough to stand on their own two feet and walk around in the world and be independent, which is ultimately the goal of nature. Nature wants us to be independent, but first we have to be safely dependent. And the message the child gets if it's told, don't cry or don't get angry, is that if I'm angry, I'm not going to get love. Now, I cannot survive without love. I can't. It's not so much an, it is an emotional thing, but it's also... Love is what keeps us bonded and what keeps me, it's the guarantee that I'm going to get food, shelter. If they don't love me, they could just leave me on the street. Now, a child doesn't have the capability to think in a nuanced way, so it's all or nothing. So if I get the message that only parts of me are acceptable and other parts are not acceptable, 
well, what do you think I'm going to choose as a child? I better adapt. I better adapt, which means that anytime I get angry, my nervous system is going to stuff the anger away until I forget that I even have anger in me. Everyone, you ever met a baby who doesn't get angry? You ever met a baby who doesn't express their sadness? No, we learn that somewhere along the way as we develop language, as we start interacting with the world. And then here's the thing. We forget that we ever had it, which is to say it becomes normal to us to not get angry or to not be joyful or to not be excited or to not feel sadness. We develop a personality which now becomes normal. That's just who I am. I'm just a nice person. I don't get angry. I don't get angry. I don't, I don't believe in being angry. I don't think it's nice to be angry. And I'm a nice person. And we think that's normal because it is to us. Or, you know, I am cool, calm, and collected. I do not get excited about anything. Well, if we could rewind the tape back to when that person was one, they got excited about a lot of things. But maybe they got the message, calm down. Their parents were too stressed out. They couldn't handle the energy. I know that happened in my family. And I've had trouble sometimes in life feeling fully alive and excited, right? And as I told you, my father came from somewhere, a traumatic past. My mother had her own traumas. So what I'm saying is that many of us are carrying traumas we don't know about. And it's not a bad thing. It doesn't make you a fucked up person. It doesn't mean there's anything wrong with you. It just means you're a human and you're woundable and you got wounded and you're carrying those wounds and you've adapted very well. I have a feeling I'm talking to a room full of very successful people, right? A, con a, con a conference about innovation and tech and health and you're all nicely dressed and you're attractive. I mean, th th this is a, a, a room full of human beings who, have, who are doing well. It doesn't make you a broken person to be carrying trauma. All it means is that you might have some work to do on yourself if you want to. You don't have to heal your trauma. That's the good news. Now, one thing the book gets into in a lot of detail that I won't talk about right now is all the ways that trauma can manifest, especially in terms of physical and mental health. It turns out that there's a lot of evidence, and Western doctors don't know this because they don't teach it in medical school. They don't teach about trauma in medical school, even though there's lots of science to support this, that chronic diseases are correlated strongly with early childhood trauma and the repression of emotions. So ALS patients tend to be very, very nice people pleasers. There's a correlation between autoimmune diseases and cancer and a kind of feeling of obligation and duty to the entire world except to oneself, putting everybody's needs before one's own. And you can imagine that that's, if that becomes normal to you, that's very stressful on your nervous system because you're not taking care of your needs. And over time, your immune system might rebel, might be a little you know, revolution, a rebellion, in your, and that's what an autoimmune disease is. Autoimmune means the immune system attacking itself. So multiple sclerosis, ALS, um, fibro, fibromyalgia, fibromyalgia uh, rheumatoid arthritis, I said. So, and then we have things like mental illnesses as well, which are also symptoms or signs or possible manifestations of trauma. I'm gonna leave this up here so I don't bend down again and make this noise that's already happened like five times. So you can read the book if you want to find out about all those fascinating but pretty sobering links between trauma and many of the things we're seeing running rampant in our world today. But I don't know who's in the room. I don't know what you guys are dealing with, and I'm not going to ask you, oh, who here has cancer or who here is depressed or, you know, it's not my business. So you might still be wondering, asking the question somewhere in the back of your mind, how do I know if I'm traumatized? You know, it doesn't feel like I am. I feel pretty normal. 
Well, watch out for that word, right? But it's, you know, it's like that, uh, I assume you guys know who Whitney Houston is, right? So, you know, how will I know if it's really trauma? You know, that's the question. And as we say in the book, the word trauma is both overused and underused. So in American culture especially, everyone's talking about how traumatizing everything is. Oh, my team lost last night. Argentina beat Croatia. I was so traumatized. <laughs> I saw the scariest movie last night, you guys. It was so traumatizing. No, it wasn't. It was upsetting. It was scary. It was disappointing. You were sad. You got over it. A trauma is a lasting wound, something that doesn't heal with time, and something that affects you, something that constricts you. I really need my iPad to learn that I want it to stay open right now. So, and the, even though it's overused, like it's kind of cheapened, it's also underused in that we underestimate how common it is and we don't see where it is. So what I want to do for the next little bit is to give you sort of a, a little checklist to go by if you're curious to know whether you're traumatized or whether you're carrying some trauma. And if you don't like the word trauma, if that seems too extreme, let's call it an emotional injury or a spiritual injury, you know? Like just because you had a broken leg when you were a kid and, and now you have a bit of a limp or it acts up when you play tennis, that doesn't mean you're disabled. It just means you have an injury. And sometimes the injury in the present affects you now. That's what a trauma is. And it's a spectrum. It goes from mild to very, very, very severe. So some signs that you might be carrying some trauma, and again, if you don't want to look at this, if you don't want to ask this question, just sit back and enjoy the sound of my voice, and it'll all be done in about 40 minutes. Or you can think about the people in your life who are clearly traumatized. <laughs> Those people need therapy. So obviously, one clear sign of trauma is like PTSD symptoms, and that's usually a sign of something pretty extreme a nervous system that scares really easily, jumping, you know, at, at, at the slightest noise, flashbacks, dissociation, horrible nightmares, chronic pain, paralyzing fear. And that's kind of like, and I'm going to give a metaphor for each one of these, which I just came up with this afternoon. I'm quite happy with these. That's like a landmine, and you don't know where it is, and you're walking through life, and you're constantly stepping on them. So the territory, the field of your mind and body are littered with these landmines. I didn't do anything that time, I promise. That's so traumatic. Everyone laughed at me. Um, and the smallest stimuli can set off the biggest response. And that's usually a sign that something pretty scary happened to you. Your nervous system incurred a shock. It got programmed. And now it's easy to trip that wire. Make sense? Like I said, other signs or clues to the mystery of your trauma might be something like chronic illness or addiction. If you're addicted to anything, not just drugs, not just substances, but behavior, sex, gambling, um, work, making friends, anything that you have to do that you can't stop doing, even if it has negative consequences, that's what an addiction is. And if you have an addiction, it, it actually is pretty much a one-to-one -one likelihood that there was some trauma in your early life. Why? Because addiction is an attempt to kill what? Pain or discomfort, or anxiety, or boredom, which is an inability to be with ourselves. And when you ask people what did their addiction give them, they say things like, it made me feel whole. It made me feel calm. Or a cocaine addict might say, oh man, it made me feel so alive, right? Or a sex addict might say, it makes me feel connected with other people. Well, those are all good things. We should feel connected with people. We should feel alive. We should be able to calm ourselves and soothe ourselves. 
The question is, why aren't our bodies able to do that without that drug or behavior? Because sometime during our development, that process got frustrated and interrupted, and that's the trauma. So that's the wound. And actually, same thing with mental illness. Mental illness, I won't get into the details here. We have two chapters on it in the book. But it's an expression in most cases. It's not genetic. There's actually no evidence that most of these things are genetic. You may hear that it's genetic, but that's just a superstition. That's like when people used to believe that uh, the sun rotates around the earth because that's how it looks. I mean, it really looks that way. We could be forgiven for believing that. And it may seem like, oh, some people have it and some people don't, and it's genetic. But actually, there's plenty of research to show, and even if you just even think about it with an open mind and heart, you'll see that these mental illnesses are happening in people who suffered real traumas. And I'm speaking as someone myself. I wouldn't say I'm mentally ill, but I've had mental health diagnoses. I take a mood stabilizer, a pharmaceutical, to stabilize my mood. I have a mild form of bipolar disorder. And again, I don't really care about the label, but it describes a pattern in my personality. And I'm very clear, and I wrote about it in the book, why that developed in my particular brain. And it is physical, but it's not genetic. I was born sensitive. I was born into a stressed out environment. I was born with certain abilities. And then those abilities got exaggerated by my, my development and turned into a split between my moods, either really, really high or really, really low, and nothing in between. So I'll get to that in a little bit. So those are other indicators that you might want to speak to somebody or get some support. Investigate, and even if the answer isn't immediately clear, that's what therapy is for. It's a patient process, you know? So those are rather obvious these clues about trauma. But here are some less obvious ones. This one might be surprising to you. If you want to know where your trauma is, you might want to take a look at some of your biggest strengths, what you consider your best qualities, the things that other people praise about you all the time, the parts of you that you most identify with, that you're most you know, proud of. Why do I say that? Well, that's not necessarily true, but it is true if they're compulsive. What does it mean to be compulsive? It means I have to do it. I have to be that way. So it's one thing for me to say I'm a kind person, which means I have kindness in me, and I can be empathetic, and I can see when someone needs something, and I'm generous and I will go out of my way to help people. It's very different to say, I'm such a nice person that I will drop everything I'm doing at the drop of a hat anytime anyone needs the slightest thing. You see the difference? This difference, in my case, between being a bright, intelligent, talented individual and being a clever performer who always has to be impressing people all the time and can't stop. And the more he gets it, the more he needs it. That was definitely something that happened in my childhood. I was born intelligent, but because of the stresses of my childhood, my little brain and nervous system made a deal. It was like, okay, we innovated, you know? They were like Tesla, we're always inventing something new. So it's like, okay, I know what I'll do. I'll be the smartest person in every room. I'll be the quickest with a, with a joke. And as you can see up here, it helps me actually. It's advantageous in this context, but tr Try that on like a third date with somebody where you're trying to really get intimate with them and get to know, or try it in bed, <laughs> you know? Or try it at a funeral or at church. <laughs> there are, it's context dependent, and if I have no choice over it, then it's controlling me, I'm not controlling it. Come on, man, as Joe Biden would say. Come on, man. Um, so, some people are super-powered, you know, alpha bosses, like, you know, many people in the tech sector are like this, just like hustle, grind set, 
you know, rise and grind, make it happen, don't stop, sky is the limit, be all you can be, all that. Well, that's great. But you ever notice that that has consequences sometimes in your life? You exhaust yourself past the point of health. You don't take care of your body. You ignore your own needs. Sometimes you forget to go to the bathroom or to eat. Some people have to collapse before they realize it. Like Hillary Clinton is someone who collapsed in the street in the middle of her 2016 campaign. Why? Because she had pneumonia and she hadn't told anybody. Because that's what success, that's what strength meant to her. Well, where did she learn that? She learned that in childhood. Times like when her mother said to her, you go back outside, you stop crying, there's no room for cowards in this house, go back outside and you figure out how to deal with those kids who are bullying you. Hillary was four years old when her mother said that to her. She was not a coward, she was a four-year-old, wanting help from her mother, wanting empathy, wanting compassion. And what's crazy is that not only is that normalized in American culture, it's celebrated. The only reason I know that story is because my dad heard it when he was watching the Democratic National Convention in 2016 when she accepted the nomination. And it was told as part of this inspiring motivational video documentary about what a great leader Hillary is. Wow, what resilient parenting. What, what, you know, they really instilled values in her. And not only that, but you know who narrated that video? Morgan Freeman, the voice of God. You know, March of the Penguins, <laughs> uh, Bruce Almighty, you know. So it's, it's a real sign of how much we normalize things that are actually not healthy, and then we celebrate them, we worship them. So, you might think of these things as superpowers. Now, I feel I'm qualified to speak on the power of superpowers, owing to the fact that I seem to resemble a certain Marvel superhero, I'm told. Yes. Well, Tony Stark, how did he get to have that superpower or that technology? How did he create that? This thing here, right, that gave him all those powers. He had a broken heart, literally. Spider-Man, how did he have all that happen to him? I think he got bit by a radioactive spider or something like that. Every superhero, in fact, has a tragic origin story, and that's how their superpowers came about. And those superpowers really help them be extraordinary in the world. But there's a cost, too. Like the Incredible Hulk, right? Very, very strong but no ability to discern when it's time to turn back into Bruce Banner, and he often squishes civilians underneath him. So we are all like that. We all have our superpowers, and we really like them, and other people like them too, and they give us praise. Oh, you're so pretty. Oh, you're so nice. Oh, you're so clever and smart. Now, of course, underneath all of these, there are genuine traits, like I said, kindness, is not, it does not injure the self. But niceness, if it's compulsive, does. So really anything that's compulsive is likely the expression of a wound. And it's a trauma because a trauma constricts us. It constricts our freedom. It constricts our self-expression. Because if I have to be a certain way, then I can't choose to be another way. Maybe a nice person would secretly in, the, in their heart of hearts, really like to say, you know what, no, I'm not going to help you move for the, last for, the, for the third time in the last year. Or no, I can't pick you up at the airport today because it's the, you know, I have my son's soccer game. But if they can't say no to that, that's a sign of trauma. And actually, as my dad says, without a healthy no, your yeses don't mean anything. You get that? If I can't say no, then I'm automatically saying yes to you. Like, I wouldn't want to ask a girl out, a woman out, let's say, because I'm a man now, I date women. <laughs> the English language is so weird. Um, I wouldn't want to ask out a woman who says, yes, 
every time a man asks her out because then her yes wouldn't mean anything. She's not saying yes because it's me, right? So we all need to have that ability to say a healthy no, and that's part of healing. And that's an expression of healthy anger, saying, you know what, I have limits, I have boundaries. Another sign where that there might be some trauma is any emotions that you are afraid to feel or that you never feel or rarely feel. Like, I never get angry, I never get sad, I never get this way or that way. That's a burial site, basically. That's a graveyard where some emotion got buried deep in the ground underneath that. And again, that can be a strength in the world. Oh, I keep an even keel, which would make me a good personal assistant, you know, because I'll keep things calm when the, when the manic alpha boss is going crazy. Well, that's fine at my job, but if I can't get upset in my own personal life, I'm setting myself up for a, an unhealthy future. Same thing with numbness. When we just go numb, we don't even know what's going on in our body or in our emotions. How are you feeling? I don't know. What's going on in your chest? I can't feel anything. Well, that's a sure sign of trauma because another way of thinking about trauma is a disconnection. We get disconnected from ourselves or from parts of ourselves. And again, no child is born not able to feel pain or not able to feel their body. That's all they feel. And any extremes, any things about you that are, so to speak, bipolar, right? It's either all or nothing, and there's nothing in between. That's another sign that there might be some trauma because you can only feel at the extremes of either end. You're either full of joy or you're flying into a rage or you're at the depths of depression, which is how I used to be. So those are some signs. Now, if I... If I wanted to be cruel, I would, I won't do it. I won't do it. Not cruel. Uh, well, okay, does anyone feel like raising their hand if they recognized anything about themselves in any of the things I just said? I promise you, you will not be alone. Okay, good. That's great. So thank you, and, and thanks the, I want to thank the rest of you liars. <laughs> You're valid too. Also, if you, keep, if, you can't, if you keep secrets, if, you, if, you're always, if you're a compulsive liar, that's a sign of trauma. Why? Think of Donald Trump. No, no, think of, I'm not accusing you, really. <laughs> Maybe you don't relate, that's fine. But think of Donald Trump, right? I talked about Hillary Clinton. I might as well talk about the other side of the polit political aisle. Donald Trump is a compulsive liar. He's a genius at lying. He can make things up on the spot. He's the funniest improv comedian of all time. He's ridiculous and he's dangerous, but he's pretty funny. And he has, he's totally divorced from reality. Well, how did that happen? Well, his father was a tyrant. You know, his father made Putin look like a nice guy. He, and his, he has a younger brother who drank himself to death from the pain. And what Donald learned to do to avoid punishment is to make things up, to lie, to tell stories and to be charming, and just to keep, the, he's like a juggler, constantly keeping the ball in the air. And you, you can actually feel it when you tap into these politicians, when you feel into their energy, maybe turn off the sound on your television. I don't know who your Serbian politicians are or, or EU people are, but you turn off the sound and you just watch their faces and you'll see their pain. You'll see it. Our leaders are some of the most traumatized people in our culture. I mean, and God knows, Adolf Hitler was a traumatized human being. Now. Am I forgiving him or letting him off the hook or condoning him for exterminating my entire extended family and wiping out six million of my people? Obviously not. It's got nothing to do with approving or disapproving or condoning. But I can have compassion for the fact that he was a human being who had certain needs and he was born at a certain time in a certain place and he grew into a certain person, a diseased, poisoned, poisonous uh, mutation of a human being, really but really only at the far end of an, a spectrum that all of us are on somewhere. And for me, actually, that's a more empowering way of looking at the world rather than there's all of us who are nice, normal people, and then there's monsters. Any of us has that capability. I know I do if I had been born in a different circumstance, you know? Um, where was I going with this? 
Is there anyone here who would like to ask a question? Because I'm not sure whether I should leave time for question and answer or if I should just fill the time with speaking. Any hands of brave people who might want to ask a question? And if not, it's totally fine. No pressure. Yes? Okay, excellent. That's one question. Who else? Anyone else? Yes. That's two. Okay, I'm going to then, I'm gonna then um, take some questions now, and if there's time afterwards, I might say a few closing words. But let's hear your questions. But, you know, I hope that gives you a picture of what the book is about. And really, what I want to do is a, it's an invitation to you. Wherever you're at in your quote-unquote healing journey, whether you haven't started or you don't think you have, or you're already just starting or you're midway along, it's an invitation to keep going, to keep asking the questions about yourself. Because ultimately, no, I'll save it for my closing remarks. This, is, this sounds like a conclusion. All right, let's get, let's get a question there first and then here. And please stand up so I have a chance of maybe seeing you. And please speak directly into the microphone. So, uh, what is your current big biggest uh, dream, your goal for the next year? My current dream for the next year? That's a really good question. I wish I had a ready-made answer. <laughs> you know, for a long time, I, I was totally disconnected from my dreams, which is another sign of trauma, I think. Um, well, it's so funny. I was about to answer it one way, and then I realized that's actually not the question. How I was going to answer it was my vision for the next year, like what I expect is going to happen, and I hope it all goes well. So I think I'm going to do some more talks in various places. My father and I are going to write a book. One of my musicals is going to be produced in Philadelphia. Uh, I'm, going to start, I'm starting a podcast in the new year about song lyrics, which you should look out for. It's called Let's Get Lyrical co-hosted with Carice Van Houten from Game of Thrones, who played uh, Melisandre. Um, what else? You know, so, uh, predictions, right? But that's not, a, that's not a dream, that's a prediction. My dream, what do I want in my heart? I'd like to meet someone who I can stay with for, for a long time, you know? And, thank you. Thank you. And, and, I, uh, and I would like that relationship to break some patterns that, I, that have become my normal. I would like that relationship to surprise the fuck out of me. <laughs> that would be really nice. And, um, and then, I, and then I, yeah, creative fulfillment. Um, and I guess if I had a concern for the next year, it's that I don't overtax myself in too many directions. I love doing a million different things, but I'd like to know how to prioritize um, all that. Does that answer your question? It, that defines my own dream also. You was like a psychic or something. I'm, I'm having a hard time understanding you. Can you speak closer uh, to the microphone? No, it's very funny how it matches a lot of my own also dreams. As oh, if good. you were like narrating my kind of similar goals. Oh, great. Well, maybe we should, we should hit the town together and... Uh... Yeah, that would be great. I know you're dead, by the way. So hey, baby. You're good, you know, already. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I already studied a lot of your father's work. Yeah. And, uh, you know... Oh, I'm a... here's another dream for me, yeah. which is to continue to work with my father... But to be, by the end of next year, I want to be able to see a future where I no longer am working with him. All right. Not, not because there's anything wrong with working with him, but because there's a time for everything. And then there's a time to, to move past things. And the guy is almost 80 years old. And I, you know, and I, I hope to have better things to do. Anyway, back, I'm sorry I interrupted you. There's more. Let's do it. Yeah, well... Uh, yeah, so for 20 years I was like uh, super traumatized about being in front of the class and everything. Yeah, and then this was like a real-time uh, healing and I was like feeling those watery emotions being invisible, you know. And then some guy told me like, okay, there's this element of fire and then that's 
just a new thing, a transformation thing, yeah. but, you know, people notice you. Yeah. And that and makes me like, okay. And how does it feel to be standing in front of a room right now asking a question? It feels very exciting, actually. Yeah? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, ex you know, exciting and scared are very close cousins, except scared has a story called, there's something wrong. Excited is just like, oh, this is new. I don't know how this is going to go. There's a, you're taking a risk, and you're contributing to everyone by doing that. So thank you for doing that healing and facing your fear and, and speaking up. I really appreciate it. All right. Thanks, man. It takes, it takes courage to heal. But ultimately, it's pretty intelligent because you're wasting a lot of energy. on Your, your trauma is a big drain it's like a hole in the bucket that's just draining your energy constantly. In your mind, your soul, your nervous system, you know. Uh, is the microphone here now? Thank you. So you mentioned at the beginning of your, you mentioned, uh, at the beginning of your talk, um, intergenerational um, trauma. Yes, yes. yes. And so the question would be around um, how is that passing uh, down mm. the, the like lineage, yeah. and then how to um, discover that because it's it's not uh, your direct experience. How to discover that if it's not your direct experience? Yes, yes. So if you don't relate, if you don't, if you look at your childhood and say, "I don't think I inherited any intergenerational trauma." No, uh, I didn't experience it for myself. Oh, directly. It's, yeah. But, but you did experience something. So I didn't experience the Holocaust. I never saw a death camp. I never, uh, no one in my family died at a young age. I never saw a Nazi soldier. I never almost starved to death like my father did. I was never separated from my mother for six weeks because she was afraid for my life. That happened to my father. Okay. And my mother was teased by her father, and, and you know, he, he could be a cruel, practical joker. And that never happened to me. So how did I absorb that trauma? It's a very good question. Well, one answer would be it's genetic. But clearly, the Holocaust is not genetic. What happens is that those events get stored in the nervous systems of my parents. Then they grow up, they become adults, they meet, fall in love, have a baby. That baby is me. And now their nervous systems, I'm relying on those adult nervous systems to teach my nervous system how to be in the world, to regulate me. It's like their, pro their nervous systems are programming my nervous system, if you want to think about it in terms of code. And there's something in their code that is a glitch. So, for, and it, it can express itself in any way. But my father's terror of, you know, his childhood, his rage at his, as an infant, an, a child is going to feel rage at the mother uh, at, of being abandoned by her, even though it wasn't a deliberate abandonment. It was to save his life. He couldn't understand that. Well, I grew up in a home where, the, again, there was no... Second World War, but there was a civil war between my parents. There was shouting, there was yelling, and I didn't know when it was going to happen. And most of the time it wasn't physical. Almost never was it physical. Once my father slapped me across the face in front of the entire extended family because I wouldn't sing happy birthday to him. I was three years old. Well, again, is that the Second World War? No. If I had to choose, I'd take the slap in the face. But to a three-year-old, I can only live my life. There's no comparing suffering. So, in other words, the things that made him so easily triggered and the tension in his voice, the tension in my mother's voice, even feeling it in his touch when he held me. We can, the babies are exquisitely sensitive. And again, our nervous systems are just being programmed. So we download that information that's not intellectual and it's not even verbal. It's emotional. And the environment, you know, the brain keeps developing at, exact, at the same rate.
for the, for the, next, for the first year of life as it was developing in the womb, which is to say it's, it's growing in size hugely. And by the time we're adults, it's quadrupled in size, most of that growth happening in the first few years, meaning that there's trillions of new nerve patterns firing and programming at every single second, which means we're very, very plastic, we're very malleable, we're very programmable. Our hard drives are very programmable, you know? And the good news is, is they're also reprogrammable, and that's what healing is. And that's what I want to leave you guys with. Do you have any other, did I answer your question? Yes. Thank you. I just wanted to hear more of it. Yeah. Please. It can happen any number of ways, but either way, it's not about the details of what happened. It's about the experience of the child, and children are exquisitely sensitive, totally needy and dependent, and make everything about them. So I didn't have the ability as a two-year-old to say, hmm, well, you know, my father did live through the Holocaust, and uh, they have a difficult marriage, and, you know, it is 1976, and the oil crisis is going on, and... You know, I, I had no perspective. It was, mommy and daddy are upset at me. What do I do about it? It must be my fault. And now I'm learning what the world is like. And then that coding gets hardwired. Or it's like firmware. It's like, it's like almost hardwired, but it's not hardwired because we can really do something about it in adulthood. So I want to say a little something about healing because that is the last word in our sub... Or trauma, illness, and healing in a toxic culture. And the good news is that healing is all, always possible. Because if trauma was the Balkan War, or the Second World War, or the war in Ukraine, or my father hitting me across the face, or sexual abuse, or abandonment, or divorce, if that's what trauma was, then it would be impossible to heal trauma. You get why? Because those things happened. They're done. Finito. Story is over. Roll credits. However, that's not what trauma is. Trauma is the lasting wound inside of us from those events. Trauma is like, trauma isn't the car crash, it's the concussion. And we can heal a concussion by taking care of it. So we can heal our wounds over time by taking care of those wounds, by recognizing that they're there, by learning to give ourselves the compassion and curiosity that we didn't get as children, again, because our parents were too stressed, not because they didn't love us in, in the vast majority of cases. And we can understand that healing is not a destination. Now, who here is on Instagram and follows some like healing or wellness accounts? You see these? Yeah. Now, we have some podcasters here who have some of those accounts, right? And they're very good, but, if you, once, but once you see a lot of these, you can, it, you can be forgiven for getting the impression of, oh my God, I'm never going to be fully healed. Oh, I got to buy this product now. I got to go to that conference. I got to go see this speaker. Well, that's what capitalism does to healing, and capitalism is a big topic in our book as well. It's a big part of what makes our, our culture toxic, and I'm not saying communism is better. All right? I'm just saying that Western globalized capitalism is very, very unhealthy for human beings, the planet, and all of us. And it's so normal we don't even see it. Um, but what was I saying? Healing. healing, right. Yes, healing. The good stuff. Um, we can always heal what's inside of us by paying attention to it, by taking care of it the way you would take care of any injury. If your child was injured, you would take care of it. If, if, if your body was injured, you would know how to take care of it. So taking care of your learning about yourself, there are many modalities, psychotherapy, yoga, psychedelics, whatever. What's that? <laughs> All right. um, and you can take your pick, even just spending time alone with yourself, going for a walk. There's a reason that my mental chiropractic service Take a walk with Daniel, that's what it's called. I go for walks with people, on the phone usually, because if they're in Belgrade and I'm in New York, we're not gonna walk in the same place. But getting outside and moving your body and changing your perspective, already you're moving against the direction of trauma. And trauma is a direction, it's like a vortex, a whirlpool, a black hole, and healing is also a direction towards freedom, towards self-expression, 
towards kindness and wholeness. And in English, the word healing comes from the root of the word wholeness. So it doesn't mean fixing yourself. It's not self-improvement. It's self-retrieval. It's self... It's finding yourself again because we got lost somewhere. It's lost and found, really, which is a lot less heavy of a way of thinking about it. Oh, I'm so traumatized. I have to heal myself. Please, Mr. Therapist, can you heal me? No, no one heals us. We, we heal, period. Healing wants to happen. Again, we talked about that tree. If you cut a gash in a tree, that tree will naturally regenerate and heal. If you cut a tree down, something else will grow from it. You don't need to stand there and issue a magic spell, you know, abracadabra heal. No, that's what nature does. There's destruction and there's healing. And so we can participate in the healing process. We can't force it. But what that takes is a, even the smallest willingness to say, you know what, I'm not as okay as I pretend to be. My normal isn't working for me anymore. I'm willing to question it. I'm willing to question who I think I am and who I think I have to be. And the great news for innovators is that when you do that, that's when you can really innovate instead of just renovating. Instead of just fixing old stuff, you can start to create new stuff because you've left the past behind you and now you're in the present and you're in touch with your emotions, your talents, your gifts, who you are, why you're here on the planet and what you're here to create. So I guess that's what I'll leave you with. That's what I would wish for all of us. Um, I don't know much about Nikola Tesla, but it sounds like he was a person who was very much in touch his whole life with what he was here to create, and it didn't matter what anyone else thought. Now, did he have trauma in his life? Yes, and maybe that played out in other ways. But that is something we can take inspiration from, that if we each rediscover ourselves or discover ourselves for the first time, we can listen to that thing in us that knows, yeah, this is what I'm here to create and then give that to the world and take part in it ourselves. So again, thank you so much for having me and enjoy the rest of the conference.